You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It's Wednesday, April 10th, 2019. My name is Michael Brooks on a Michael Wednesday. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps. From the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA, on today's program, the crew discusses the news while Sam gears up for his Vegas conference. I'm sure you'll hear all about it tomorrow. It's lit, Sam. Hello. Hashtag me too. (laughs) I'll definitely do that bit soon, the Sam in Vegas bit on today's program. Bibi Netanyahu retains power in Israel, and it's time that we get serious about how politics actually works there. Trump's obsession with framing Iran as a terrorist threat and the Shia-Sunni split. We'll get to that, how that actually looks in reality. The Trump administration continuing to strongly suggest they're going to return family separations as a manner of policy. Theresa May is speaking with EU officials today in a request for a Brexit extension to June 30th as that process grinds on. Macron appears to be softening a little bit. YouTube had to take down its live stream of the congressional hearings on white supremacy and hate speech on Facebook because there were too many... (laughs) anti-Semitic and racist comments on the stream. Well, I mean, to be fair, there's too many on a lot of videos. That one was just exceptionally visible. Right. True that. Texas bill would make it possible to put women to death for having an abortion as the extreme continues to migrate to the center in the Republican Party. Virginia drug company is charged with a billion-dollar opioid marketing scheme targeted at addicts. Amazon is not going to hit its sustainability goals. There's something shocking. And former CBS News reporter Laura Logan is joining uh, Sinclair in another incredibly unsurprising headline. And and stability wears on in Guyana. Potential sort of oil-related political change in the works there. What happened to the Venezuela coup? Maybe there wasn't any organic support for Guaido. That's interesting. And Charlie Kirk and his fellow band of idiots have a very interesting concept of what the Kurdish rebels, the Kurdish YPG rebels are. And uh, we might need to dispel it a little bit. All that plus RAP to the free exchange of ideas and a lot more on today's majority report. Oh, and of course I should mention socialist surge in the city of Chicago. Um, the four of us are here tomorrow. What are we saying? In no time you'll be hearing Sam say like, shall I woke up? He gets in his like, he gets this kind of like drinking voice going on because he's like rat pack intonation. He's, just he's sort in of like, tort mode right he's now. He's just like, I was, so I was at the craps tables and, uh, and it was a friend of mine who was actually friends with Benjamin and I. We wrote a pitch together for ABC, but the pitch was a joke. We didn't actually want to sell the script. But uh, so we met uh, writing that and he recognized me because he saw me on Hayes. And, uh, and anyway, so I'm up 15 and uh, joining me now is a guy f- from a John Grisham book. Sam's trips to Vegas are like his solstices. Totally. They're definitely like his, his, yes. It's a very important time for transition, reinvention, rebirth. Yep. I go to the 24-hour drone festival and Sam goes to Vegas to talk about dorts. We all need to restore ourselves in our own way. No, it's beautiful. 
Turns out that the baby formula company decided that it was... was it's just cheaper to kill people, so like, let's che- just kill them. It's cheaper to kill the babies. Wow. Was just, wow, so you have this in documents? Yep, the document right here from May 5th right there, actually like- says it'll be cheaper to just kill these kids with a uh, bad formula source from China than give them formula. That that really is just stunning. In, dis- in Discovery, we found a document that said, uh, on the one hand, we can make our products safer for people. On the other hand, we can make lots of money and kill people. We decided to do we the latter. We decided to do the latter. And that is true. They actually wow. really do find stuff like that in Discovery from these companies. I guess, if, if you, I feel like if you have any understanding of how American business works, this should never actually be shocking. But it is just on the pure, like... It's like the we were joking about Rob Blagojevich last night, how like Rob Blagojevich is in jail for doing what basically every single politician do, does, except he like insisted on spelling out the last part of it and like officially making it illegal on a wiretap. So these companies do like companies all the time calculate that they will put their margin over safety. That of course, but it, it what it, it what is different is when you literally have it in writing. Like, hey, does this machine gun work? Nah. Most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. But, I mean, obviously it would be a super pain to fix it. All right, let's put that in writing. You're getting everyone so horny for torts. <laughs> that really is just stunning. And then that's... <laughs> <laughs> yep, and you can find that all there at uh, deadbabyformula.com. And you can track her case uh, over there at the... Fo- that incredible. It really is just stunning. How's anyway, my sound? Anyway, my next guest is right here already, <laughs> my, so we'll get, you yeah, got to get out yeah, of the yeah, seat. Yeah. <laughs> Jake's here. Hi, Jake. Uh, I still wear hey, this shirt. Hey, it's awesome. It's so, uh, yeah, people need to be progressive. We all got Sue the Collector t-shirts. Sue the Collector.com. No one that will ever guy, be as good as that guy. No, that guy's he was a hero. extremely on his shit, that and I amazing. wear the shirt in his honor every night. Did you know that you need, if in order to call you, past 2 p.m. you need a queen's mark because u.s uh, uh debt collectors are actually subject to commonwealth law i had no Did idea you know if it debt- turns out i'm suing them now if a de- debt collector calls you after 5 p.m they basically owe you a million dollars no that was all good info. <laughs> no, no that guy was amazing yeah. please please listen to that interview that will make like everybody's life better that yep. was awesome time to get a credit card and put yeah, some yeah. things on it <laughs> yeah time to go enjoy yourself because apparently it doesn't matter. Uh, basically, Sam could just take tomorrow off, too. I think we've got torts coverage covered. That's what we should do for the next uh, April Fool's show. <laughs> we do the we torts coverage. Tor- We're all in Vegas and Sam's in Brooklyn. <laughs> and we are like, like, Sam, Sam, can you hear me? <laughs> he gets, man, he's all like. He's all like, yeah, next we have uh, Rod Covington from Covington Berlin & Co. It's a Tallahassee-based firm uh, suing diaper makers. Yeah. Guys, guys! When we're not responsive in the studio, I think Sam feels like an astronaut like outside of the space capsule a little bit. <laughs> and to be fair, you know, he's he's discovering like the greatest corporate malfeasance in the world. And we're like back in the studio being like, hey, is Bumble's more popular now? Hey, Brendan, who's one of the Mets <laughs> <Yeah. guy? laughs> <sighs> oh, torts. That's pretty great. It really is just stunning. So more I on should, that dude, tomorrow. I want to, you know what? That is such an awesome idea that I really want us to do. I want to be Sam hosting the tort show. I'll be the lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so Bob McLaughlin, uh, and when did you first get uh, uh, an intimation that the baby formula was, was not what it was said to be? It didn't have extra vitamin B. It had lead. Well, I was hearing from a local doctor that like seven straight babies had died, and I, I, I began to draw a parallel between this baby form that they'd been given out, and I called the company, and they acted very suspicious. They hung up on me immediately, and all of a sudden, I saw private detectives outside of my house, so I thought, maybe I'm on to something. So seven babies. That really is just stunning. Uh, okay. well, this will be the <laughs> yeah, remainder right. of the show. Uh, good part of it. Uh, that's actually pretty gold, but so is this. Um Elon Omar continues to hopefully, I mean, the best case scenario with what she does to all of these ghouls and goblins of the right wing is just shoot a bunch of cortisol in their bodies. Um, They continue to freak out about her. Uh, This is in a segment, and we'll get to the Netanyahu reelect shortly. But 
you just had a prime minister who is formalizing, ran a campaign on formalizing an apartheid state in contradiction of any type of law, if you take that seriously, any type of sort of basic human progress that we theoretically supposed to have, have sort of achieved. And this segment turns into a meltdown about Ilan Omar talking about the atmosphere in this country targeting Muslims after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And Brian Kilmeade, is, he's, uh, he's worked up. All right. Uh, meanwhile, let's talk a little bit about uh, Congresswoman Elon Omar. Uh, she was last month at an event supporting CARE, which is the Council on American Islamic Relations. And um, there's a soundbite we're about to play for you that has got some people upset because of how it trivializes uh, September the 11th, uh, the greatest terror attack in our nation's history, which was conducted by terrorists. And here she is talking about how Muslims in this country are scrutinized these days. And then listen to how she describes September the 11th. Far too long, we have lived with the discomfort of being a second class citizen. And frankly, I'm tired of it. And every single Muslim in this country should be tired of it. CARE was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something and that all of us were starting to lose access to our civil liberties. Yeah, some people did something, uh, like an unprovoked attack, killing people in the thousands. Pentagon, thousands in the Pentagon, and you know, the Flight 93, as well as in the World Trade Center. Uh, really? There's so few people did something? You have to wonder if she's an American first. She got, Dan Crenshaw tweeted this out. First member of Congress to ever describe terrorists who killed thousands of Americans on 9-11 as some people who did something. Dash, unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And could you imagine if she was representing your community your, and you were in her district, how embarrassed you must feel today? Many people are upset because they just said she was flippant about it. Some people did something. It was a, an attack that changed, the, changed our entire country. I read oh, that true. someone tweeted this out. They said, some people did something. Sounds like a bake sale. But it does not really sound like a terrorist attack that killed 3,000 people and altered the New York City skyline forever. So as a Muslim American, you should be more outraged because they sullied your religion. In the name of religion, they kill Americans and still do it on a daily basis. There's so much to pick apart here. And what I find ironic is, is part of to pick apart is, you know, and I'm so burned out on all of these tone conversations. But these are the people that are all, you know, oh, my God, people on the left, they're too uptight. They need to take a joke. By the way, sometimes that's true. And sometimes people are reaching for straws and trying to, you know, I, I get when we get clips like that of right wing figures saying something that's like, OK, that's slightly inelegantly put, but we can do better than that. They built a whole segment on a primary point, which is objectively true, which is that Muslims were both targeted and focused on by state agencies uh, through policies like the Patriot Act, as well as through vigilante violence after 9-11. So groups needed to form to protect a persecuted category of people that had nothing to do with the September 11th attacks. That's what she's talking about. This is also on the heels, let's just, the third thing, of a couple of days ago, a guy being arrested with plans to assassinate her as they continue to try to amplify the conspiracies and nonsense about her. And then that brings us to Dan Crenshaw, I will never forget. Here's a good example of some of an of an un PC thing I can live with. I don't care that some guy in Saturday Night Live made a joke about his eye patch. I do not. And if you do care, and if it was offensive, here's what you do. On the next weekend update, you say, Hey, maybe that joke was in poor taste. I'm sorry. Although, by the way, check out our back catalog of every single joke we did about David Patterson, the entire premise of which is he's blind. <laughs> Okay, that joke went on for years. Uh, I apologize. Not, let's give a national program uh, platform to a fascist member of Congress. And here, uh, Matt, what do we have up on screen here? Uh, Dan Crenshaw, along, alongside a few other uh, Tea Party people, I can't remember any of the names off the top of my head, but some not great people, 
was a member of, as uh, Mike Michaels says, the oldest and largest Tea Party group. Here's, I, I'm just going to read from Mike Michaels. The oldest and largest Tea Party group on Facebook would like to congratulate Daniel Crenshaw, one of our Tea Party group admins, for his impressive win in yesterday's Texas District 2 runoff. Dan will easily win in November and is going to make a superb congressman. Now, another, Hashtag uh, MAGA. another post you might like right. to see from uh, Mike Michaels here. Yes, just to I get would. It. Get an idea of what this, uh, what the moderators, you know. I would like to get an idea of what kind of ideas were being exchanged. How well was this administrated? Oh, here's Mike Michaels. At least the KKK was white supremacy run by whites. Now, on the other hand, the BLM vermin is nothing but black supremacy with white masters. So that's just Mm. the type of people that Dan Crenshaw likes to hang out with. Uh, There we go. And so he gets to be sanct. And this is another, I mean, but again, this is a perfect example if you want to take the the angle of Dan Crenshaw, Dan Crenshaw is a far right extremist who was part of this group who ran on the wall, who ran on a pure MAGA platform. Some I don't even remember who was it. Was it Pete Davidson? Yeah. Made some eye patch joke about him. Honestly, so he I'm like sorry. a porn star. Okay, it didn't even really who make sense. Cares. Be an adult. Who cares? But because of, of, a, of a certain set of sensitivities, this guy – and again, it's totally – it isn't like, hey, I'll issue an apology. Sorry about that one specific joke. Or I'll do you another one. OK, Dan Crenshaw can come to the studio. I'll apologize to him and then I'll say, hey, my bad. Sorry to, uh, to uh, mock uh, your eye patch. Incidentally, why are you running on white supremacy? Maybe you'd like to answer that on Weekend Update instead of like, oh, they were buddies. You know, this is a, this is a micro version of the Samantha B. Glenn Beck thing. It's like this incredible, weird contradiction inside certain types of liberal and centrist types where this is this extraordinary uptightness and oversensitivity. But then at the same time, a total inability to see what certain people are for who they are. And this guy is someone who is out trying to exploit uh, and and demonize Ilan Omar when she's getting when someone was just arrested for trying to assassinate her and you're clutching at and you're reaching for straws for her an inelegant phrase in a speech on an important issue which you're on the wrong side of yeah the speed with which they pivoted from the topic at hand which is islamophobia and muslims being unfairly targeted to um, 9-11 was really, really bad, and it was done by Muslim terrorists, kind of implies that the Muslims in this country deserved what happened to them after 9-11. I don't think it kind of does. It, it also, directly does. Yeah, it yeah. also shows like how everything these people say is 100% projection, right? Because Ilhan Omar never even said the dual loyalty thing. Never. They only said that she said it, and you know that's because they were thinking of saying it about her. Uh, Virginia's Corey Stewart, uh, we have this picture up on here, uh, un- was another one of those admins of that uh, Facebook page. Dan Crenshaw, when asked about this, was like, uh, I barely even knew I was a member of that. Uh, how is this news? So he doesn't think he should you ever. Know, I have an actual legitimate question here because I don't do this do loyalty stuff for anybody because it's mostly just nonsense uh, in general, even when marshaled against other, because it's just the wrong way of framing the issue. Like you could say, Hey, are you lobbying for the Emirates? That's a, like an actual question. Uh, but uh, Dan Crenshaw, do you have dual loyalty to the Confederacy and the modern United States? And that is like my legitimate question to most frontline Republican leaders. It's a fair question. Also, you know, the mention of care and people call that a terrorist organization, not according to the state department, uh, one that is uh, associated to this, uh, according to the State Department, is the one Seb Gork is affiliated with. Mm. But Dan Crenshaw doesn't seem to be too worried about that. One. No, I don't see any. I, wonder, I don't see any tweets about that. I wonder how Dan Crenshaw is making the selections of which terrorism, uh, alleged terrorist ties, he's uh, upset about. I know, but by all means, establish an Instagram friendship with him, and definitely apologize if you've ever been rude to him on a comedy show. That's really crucial, really strategic. I mean, I mean, in my, I mean, honestly, like, look, let's go absurd for a second. The equivalent of this is some, you know, I'm being absurd. I'm not drawing a direct parallel. Calm down. But, you know, SNL of 1930s Germany. Oh, my God. Hitler's mustache is so disgusting. You know, that really hurt my feelings. And I'm a veteran. Oh, OK, why don't you come on Weekend Update? We can become pals. There were also eyepatch Nazis, too. Right. 
That's true. Yeah. I mean, you got to ask yourself, are people being systematically discriminated against for having eye patches in this country? I think the answer is no. Well, sure. And again, it's not even like if you want to apologize, do, cool. That's not even like the point. Well, it's the a point joke. is the it, first of all, it's a joke. And that in general, I'm sorry, calm down. But the other point is like the gulf in between a throwaway joke and we're going to go all the way to flying this guy into New York and making his 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 most prominent outside of right wing echo chamber media exposure is, oh, look at this nice veteran that's buddying with Pete Davidson after Pete Davidson made a joke about his eye patch. Yeah, that's how that's what they did. That's I mean, how that you launder quite white supremacists into the mainstream. That's it. And then all of a sudden, that turned into a nothing story to a very real story. Or sorry, I'll say white nationalist. Oh yeah, to, no, so no, Dan well, yeah. So I don't have to mm. uh, uh, invite Dan Crenshaw here to apologize. No. To I'm, 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 well, I'm just going to say nationalist, so we don't we can really be in the clear. I'm looking at Matt's computer screen right now. It's just a rogues gallery of Nazis with eye patches. <laughs> and I will. No, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. <laughs> We're sorry. The majority report is supported in part by Simple Habit. Simple Habit is a mobile app that provides a massive and diverse library of five-minute guided meditations. And the majority report audience can try Simple Habit totally free for an entire week when you go to simplehabit.com slash majority. There's a growing body of scientific evidence. I would primarily look uh, at Richie Davidson's work at the University of Wisconsin. It goes back to Herbert Benson at Harvard. I think he started documenting this stuff in the 70s, at least the 80s. Stress, relaxation, focus, depression, anxiety, meditation has a myriad of benefits. Simple Habit is over 2,000 guided meditations specifically designed for different parts of your day and just about anything you might be dealing with in life. They have guided meditations for mindfulness, meditations for anxiety, for depression, for when you're having trouble falling asleep, meditations for when you're wanting to overcome pro- procrastination or for when something important is going on at work, and meditations designed for parents. They have meditations made specifically for when you're waking up or on your lunch break or when you've just gotten home from work or when you're going to bed. As I always say, the one that helps me go to sleep is the one that I have come to rely on. Incredibly helpful. And uh, but I do love. I mean, I have a background. I've I've practiced different meditation techniques, primarily mindfulness, for a while. And I actually, I sort of love the menu. I love the different options. There really are a lot of different ways to meditate. Different people are trying to accomplish different things with meditation, and Simple Habit is able to cater to just about anyone, regardless of what your goals are with meditation or how much past experience they have with meditation. The variety of guided meditations and Simple Habit is what sets is part of what sets it apart. Simple Habit just won the 2008 Google Play Award for Wellbeing App. It's available on iOS, Android, and web browser. And the majority report audience can try it for free by going to simplehabit.com slash majority. If you're watching on YouTube, we've put a link in the video description. So Benjamin Netanyahu has hung on to power in Israel. And this really shouldn't come as much of a surprise to anybody. It was a very tight election. And his primary uh, you know, opponent in the election uh, was not running uh, with any kind of fundamental strategic alternative uh, to Netanyahu's position. That's a really important thing to highlight here because... The stylistic concern that Netanyahu is totally alienated, as an example, cert like the center left, broadly speaking, or that Israel should sort of pretend to have a, a sort of more respectful relationship to the United States, no matter who's in power, that's the standard issue position of, as an example, even just like the security establishment in Israel. You're much more likely to hear a former Mossad leader or a defense official even potentially more substantively say, acknowledge that as an example, the Iran deal was working, uh, that it was effective, uh, even though they had problems with it and they shouldn't undermine it, or even make a sort of occasional uh, tip of the hat to doing something about the Palestinians. This was not in the election. What was in the election was Netanyahu running clearly on essentially formalizing apartheid 
and um uh and also most likely uh exchanging a deal with prospective coalition partners to make himself immune from criminal prosecution because he's under indictment right now. Let's go to two different reactions to his win. We'll start with Trump, and then we'll go to the Palestinian uh, analyst, Diana Buto, uh, and we'll uh, come back and, and go from there. Say it. So the fact that BB1, I think we'll see some pretty good action in terms of peace. Look, Everyone said, and I never made it a promise, but everybody said you can't have peace in the Middle East with Israel and the Palestinians. I think we have a chance, and I think we have now a better chance with Bibi having won. Yes, please. So there is a possibility that, as Professor Juan Cole talked about, that there is a new Saudi initiative that is very different from the one in 2003. The one in 2003 was a Saudi proposal that ended up going nowhere. Essentially, if the Israelis withdrew from the West Bank and Gaza, if they created a genuine two-state solution along 67 borders, then the Saudis would lead the rest of the Israeli of the Arab world in recognizing Israel. The dynamic we're in now is that Israel informally has very tight connections with Saudis, with the Emirates. Obviously, they already have diplomatic relations with Jordan and Egypt. And The preoccupation and overwhelming focus of both Israel and particularly the Saudis is Iran. And there's really no problem with selling out the Palestinians in the process. It's not like there's any sincere concern uh, from any of these parties about, you know, liberating the Palestinians from the Israelis. So this is the so a peace deal could mean, you know, some type of. You know, I don't even know how they'll phrase it, but it will be no delivery for the Palestinians. It might it will just be a sort of formula, formalization of subjugation, even if it's called a state, which I at this point even doubt. Uh, and then it will be, well, no, we delivered a region-wide peace deal. And that can, of course, be sold as something bigger and better and more bold and ambitious and so on. Now, uh, it does remain to be seen because I think a deal like that actually could set off another wave of political unrest across the region. This is Diana Butu on Butu on Democracy Now. And we're also joined by Diana Butu, a, a, a Palestinian attorney, has been a, uh, an advisor to uh, to uh, President Mahmoud Abbas in uh, negotiations with Israel. Your reaction to the elections and also to what appears to be historically low turnout by the Palestinian citizens of, of Israel, what the significance of that is? They, but in terms of the reaction vis-a-vis the, the, the outcome that we've seen, this was, in effect, uh, for Palestinians at least, this was an election in which you either choose Trump or you choose Trump. The, the positions that both uh, Likud took and Benny Gantz took were virtually indistinguishable, particularly when it came to Palestinians. They bragged about how much they were going to beat up on Palestinians and, uh, and then took their voters to, as, a, as a result. So it's not at all surprising that we see this outcome, given that we really had two candidates that were quite mirroring one another when it came to this election. In terms of the uh, the voter turnout, there were a number of factors in terms of low uh, Palestinian voter turnout. One was the fact that a number of people have ideologically chosen to boycott. And then others was because there was a level of voter intimidation and people also believing that their MKs their members of Knesset were unable to deliver. The big problem, however, is that um, that we've seen a rise in fascism in Israel. And instead of people boycotting, we were hoping to see that people would have come out in greater numbers to try to at least push back against that tide. As it stands right now, although the vote, uh, the, the ballots have not been completely counted, we really only have about 15 out of 120 members of Knesset who believe in equality and who believe in an end to, to the occupation. And that's a very sad uh, indication of, of where Israel is. Diana Butu, can you explain who can vote in the Israeli elections and who can't, and also respond to these 1,200 cameras being put in uh, the election uh, booths, the polling places of in Arab neighborhoods? 
Yes, definitely. In terms of who can vote, it's only citizens of Israel who are allowed to vote. And so of that citizenry, about 16 percent of the people who are eligible to vote are Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. Uh, but then the, you look at the vast remaining of, remainder of people that Israel controls, whether it's people who live in the West Bank, in the, in the Gaza Strip, or in uh, Israeli-occupied East Jerusalem. You're looking at close to uh, six million individuals who are, who are in, ineligible to vote in Israeli elections and yet are being governed by Israel. In terms of the cameras, um, this is not only a violation of Israeli law, but it was something that the Israeli prime minister brazenly is supporting and had came out and said, uh, yes, we shouldn't be worried about this. They should, there should be cameras in all polling stations. The reason this, of course, is so alarming is the fact that this leads to voter intimidation. There are a number of Palestinians who are working either as teachers, as, as uh, in, in other ministries, and who, um, seeing that there is a camera in place, are going, feel rightfully so that they're that their votes are being monitored, whether they show up to the polls or who it is that they're going to be voting for. And so this type of voter intimidation is the type of, of action that Netanyahu has done, not only when it came to this election, but in previous elections where he tried to claim that, that Arabs were, quote, voting in droves. He's, an ideologi he's ideologically opposed to Palestinian freedom, ideologically opposed to Palestinians having equality, and will do anything that it takes to try to intimidate and to try to make sure that there is perpetual control over Palestinian lives. That's absolutely true. That's an objective statement. And the parties that are rising in Israel, if anything, are even more extreme than Netanyahu and certainly synchronized with him. But I think it's really important. And I'll loop back to some of the results in a second. But this is not just Netanyahu. So it's encouraging that a Beto O'Rourke or a Pete Buttigieg have criticized him. Obviously, Sanders has led the way in this, but now there's, you know, and again, several candidates didn't go to APAC. Sanders was the only one who specifically identified why he didn't go to APAC. So he still stands apart and is better than the other candidates on this vital issue. But if you frame it, and I mentioned this yesterday, Netanyahu, yes, is, is a monster. He's a leader in the authoritarian trend. He's an apartheidist. He's a bigot. Uh, He's he's a repugnant individual to anybody with human values. But unfortunately, he is in the center, clearly, of Israeli politics. He's going to surpass David Ben-Gurion in terms of length of leadership of this country. And I'm going to quote now from the New York Times, uh, because this write-up is an accurate reflection of how a primarily f very hard right, very unconcerned about these issues that we might be concerned about in terms of justice or equity, uh, Israeli electorate is voting. And also the dire state of, and my unbelievable sympathies for any part of the Israeli left, uh, which, yes, the joint list still did manage to send some people in parliament. I'll get to that in a second. But quoting now uh, from the New York Times, though in many ways they have, um, Benjamin Netanyahu's apparent re-election as prime minister of Israel attests to a starkly conservative vision of the Jewish state and about its people. Where they are, and where they are headed. They prize stability as well as military and economic security that Mr. Netanyahu has delivered. They are in many ways never been safer, though they remain afraid, especially of Iran and its influence over their neighbors, against which Mr. Netanyahu has relentlessly crusaded. They are persuaded by his portrayal of those who challenge him, whether Arab citizens or the left, as enemies of the state, and they take his resemblance to authoritarian leaders around the world as evidence that he was ahead of the curve. They credit Mr. Netanyahu, whose, whose strategic vision values power and fortitude above all with piloting Israel to unprecedented diplomatic heights, and they believe still more is possible, and they loathe to let anyone less experienced take controls. Let's be honest with ourselves, said Michael B. Orn, a former Israeli ambassador to Washington. Our economy is excellent. Our foreign relations have never been better. We're secure. We've got a guy in politics for 40 years. We know him. The world knows him. And even our enemies know him. So that is a really perfect reflection of most of, again, still the majority of the Israeli electorate. This was a much tighter race. But as Diana Buto pointed out, I mean, Benny Gantz is a former military chief. He presided over the atrocities of Gaza of 2014. He bragged about his brutality against the Palestinians. There's no daylight here. There isn't even the old sort of like, 
two-state quasi-peace process versus full apartheid daylight. And even then, was all, that was always suspect because settlements had always expanded under labor governments. So the next step of how to actually talk about this and figure this out is going to mean that Netanyahu actually can't just be a stand-in for a fuller and honest actual accounting of what Israeli politics is. And there's a reason he keeps winning. <laughs> there's a reason that the left is totally marginalized there, even the center left like Moretz and that labor uh, you know, is essentially irrelevant and offers critiques on the economy, which, by the way, I don't know how strong the Israeli economy is. It's built on a lot of the same fundamental inequalities and bubbles that the rest of the neoliberal world is. Israel tracks the whole Western order with that. And part of the reason, the last thing I'll leave you with, is is that the broader critique of Israel is harder, not just because of all of the things that people talk about that are real. Of course, there's an Israel lobby, like there's a Saudi lobby and all sorts of other lobbies that influence power and exertion. And of course, there's people's absolutely rightful concern about the history of anti-Semitism uh, and how we discuss and talk about Israel. But there's also the reality that someone like Jeff Halper will put forward that Israel is a microcosm of how the Western world, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, is managing uh, the fallout of today's global economy and power relations. So that if you start to look at the U.S. role in Afghanistan that continues to this day, if you look at Iraq, if you look at all sorts of insurgencies and counterinsurgencies and drone programs and the merging of military and policing at home and internationally, you can start to look at the savagery and management of Gaza as a microcosm and a showcase for how all of those relationships work. And it's very literal. I mean, Israel, there's a reason Israel is a prime security systems and weapons exporter in the world. That oppression, that dynamic is an advertisement for security policies, for weapons, for population control, this is going to. There's a reason that Israeli companies are involved in you know, things like detention centers. There's a reason that going back to the 1980s, some of the things that we talk about that Reagan supported in Central America, uh, some of the death squads and mass killings in places like Guatemala and El Salvador also included flying in Israeli trainers. So Israel has also become a showcase for this broader barbarism of this relationship. And that critique is going to go far beyond Netanyahu, and it's going to implicate all of us. So that's uh, a sort of big picture around that election. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Well, I think that was all pretty good. Um, I would just reiterate uh, that Israel, like, I feel like it's mask off time for Israel. You know, like Definitely. they can't keep playing this game about how, oh, it's the only democracy in the Middle East and we That's have a, just such human an rights and gay rights and stuff like, right. no, I think more and more Americans are waking up to the fact that that's not true. It is. a. I mean, OK, it's complicated, definitely. But I feel like sometimes people use that as a cop out to avoid taking a position on it. And some aspects of it are not that complicated. Like if you have a population of people that is subject to your domination who don't have citizenship rights and don't get to vote, it's not a democracy. Period. And nothing complicated. Don't let people use the complicated evasion with you on this. It's not. I mean, how you actually solve a problem like this and the logistics of it and the culture of it and the politics and the economics, yes, that's complicated. But the basic analysis of this situation Anybody says that it's complicated, they're either totally ignorant or they're trying to hustle you. It's, just, it's nonsense. <laughs> the actualities of the reality are quite clear. And again, I mean, look, if you put the shoe, if you, if you flip the situation, and there was a group of, of Jewish people that lived in two disparate pieces of land. They were kicked off. Hundreds of thousands of people were kicked off of, of their homes to begin with. They're in these small slots controlled by another state and regularly killed and have second-class citizenship, we would be rightfully appalled at like the greatest currently existing act of anti-Jewish violence and, and, and uh, oppression on the planet. I mean, there's nothing complicated about that basic analysis. Nothing. And it makes, you know, I mean... I know that obviously the Democratic Party and Democratic candidates, even the best ones, are not going to be where I am on this issue yet. 
Of course not. But I got to tell you, like, I mean, look, in some ways, Bill de Blasio is just such a delusional buffoon. I don't even know what to say. But he's the one who's trying to make himself a thing in 2020. And obviously, he'll never be. But the notion that he, and he still is the mayor of New York City, that's an important position, goes to APAC and attacks BDS while at the same time, you know, discoursing that he's like the real social Democrat candidate. Whoa. Yeah. And for people to rail against Trump's racism while totally ignoring the racism of Netanyahu and the Israeli state is ridiculous. Like people could say, oh, it's not about race. It's about, you know, the Jewish people. But like, how do they treat Jews who are not white in Israel? Absolutely. That's a, of course, of course. Um, We'll get to actually more of this stuff uh, in the uh, in the fun half. Uh, some of it won't be so fun because we'll talk a little bit about Iran. We have some fun stuff about Trump's trip to Mount Vernon, though. Okay, but I want to. But I want to actually. I love that. All right, I want to actually end in a slightly proper time here. The first half of the show. Get to the fun half. Become a member of the Majority Report today. Majority FM slash Become a member. It's how this show happens. It's how we have an independent voice for conversations, for debates, for differing perspectives inside the left. Ideas. Ideas and exchanges of ideas. And some of us are actually committed to those we things. we got to source our ideas, folks. We have our source, idea yeah. suppliers. Yeah. Ideas don't come from... Well, well yeah. ideas... Do they come from here? I don't know. I, I, don't know. I, I think I'm on something here. Where do ideas come from? Um, so become a member of majority.fm slash become a member. Less than a cup of coffee a day. Just coffee.co. Fair trade tea, coffee, or chocolate. Get the majority report blend. It's a win for everyone. Last night on the Michael Brooks show, Somya Shankar broke down the Indian elections for us, uh, why the left overperforms in the state of Kerala. And then Felix Biederman and I had a great time just actually dunking on Dave Rubin. And in the post game, we had a really great uh, discussion of what the psychology of Democratic and Republican um, fundraising emails reveal about the different parties. Oh, so why is it that all the Republican emails are just like, hey there, Michael, uh, they tried to end the white race. Well, I'm proud to tell you, we didn't let them. But can you believe that Rosie O'Donnell's still coming for us? And then like all of the Democratic emails are like, dear Michael, this is Barack Obama and I'm freaking out. Here's uh, oh yeah, we use this. this apparently from Nancy Pelosi, kiss all hope goodbye. If Boehner has his way, we might as well blah blah blah. Yeah, Paul Begala, I'm bleeding. So uh, some of the problems with the uh, loser and winner attitudes. Update wow. at yeah. dctc dot org, org crushing blow. <laughs> Jesus Calm down, D trip. You're like yeah. a bad ex. I know it's not good. Tough stuff. So uh, that was very fun. Patreon.com slash TMBS. We're doing a, a Sunday show because the last week uh, of the month we're in L.A. and we're off. So we want to make sure everybody gets their full shows this month. Uh, Dom Kechiachu is joining us to talk about uh, the end of Empire and the creation of the Third World and then uh, a bunch of other stuff. As always, Michael Brooks' show on YouTube. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Get your tickets. The surge is happening. I saw it today in the numbers, so now we're actually a very few left. Get your tickets to the Bootleg Theater, April 20th, Michael Brooks' live show with Anna Kasparian, Big Waz, Nando Vila, and the whole crew. Jamie, what's going on? So this week on the Antifada, we have an episode that is out now that is free for everyone. We had on Brett and Brian from Street Fight Radio nice. for a very cool, very fun, exciting show. They're very just cool, very fun. Very legal, very cool. <laughs> uh, we definitely did not say anything treasonous. It was all satire. <laughs> um, they're just like chill anarchist dads from Ohio who do a wonderful show out there. Um, one day a week, they just listen to people talk and complain about their jobs and I think it's a really good way to build solidarity and class consciousness. And sometimes they hook people up with like organizers and stuff, which is very cool. So we talked with them about drugs and parenting and politics and all cool. that good stuff. And then out on Friday, we have a bonus with Leslie Lee the Third from Struggle Session, where we all talk about the movie Us, which is very good if you haven't seen it yet. 
I like Leslie the Third, and I'm bad at promoting other shows I've been on, but I will say I was on Struggle Session to talk about Scarface recently, and that was actually a great conversation, uh, and that's a really fun show. I know you were on there recently, too. Yeah, yeah. We talked about uh, Interview with a Vampire. Matt, what's up? The uh, new Literary Hangover episode, The Soul of Man Under Socialism by Oscar Wilde, is uh, available online now. Um, I have, this is the, uh, if you have the YouTube up, Jamie, um, it's got, uh, you can see the, the sort of design on the cover. There's two things you can notice. One is that under socialism was omitted, uh, even in Oscar Wilde's lifetime. Didn't want to have that part on. Let's just call it the soul of man. It'd be simpler to sell. Um, that sort of pattern with the leaf, but it's sort of geometric. That comes from a guy named William Morris, who was like a sort of early sort of libertarian socialist uh that uh, he was like a printmaker he made wallpaper famous for making wallpaper and also was like we need to go back to sort of feudal ways of uh of of uh, having uh, meaning in work sort of mercant early mercantilist mm-hmm. sort of a nostalgia type of thing that was very influential to oscar wilde um check that episode out uh yeah and subscribe to the youtube channel if you haven't that's awesome um what uh, I told you that the guy there was a guy at an event who came up to me and and was and he was like he's like I'm legit like I'm a fan of all the shows you guys are like the Wu Tang of left wing podcasts and that's actually not a bad analogy I kind of buy it um, all right guys we'll see you in the fun half. Yeah. Le temps 